This is the Nomad Futurist Podcast. A podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and transformation. Connect with us, share your thoughts with us at nomadfuturist.com. Let's get this started. Here are Phil and Nabil. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Nomad Futurist. This is your co-host, Nabil Mahmood from Kona, Hawaii. This is your co-host, Philip Koblenz from Montclair, New Jersey. And this is Jeremy Pease from the Colony, Texas. Jeremy, thank you so much for taking time to join us today. Before we get started, could you share with our audience what do you do for a living? Yes, absolutely. Appreciate you guys having me. And I am the CEO of Colo House. Just joined in October of 2022 to lead this organization through the next chapter of what we've got ahead of us. The honeymoon period. Exciting. Still there. <laughs> well, for starters, congratulations. I think you're probably the right individual to do so with your background in the data center industry. How did you get started in the data center industry? Yeah, really that started more as a customer. So I was a consumer of the data center space for quite a while before I ever actually made the conversion and came to the dark side, if you will, to actually work on the data center side of it. It's dark yeah. side in the best possible sense of that phrase. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a wonderful and interesting space and I've enjoyed it. Again, it consumed cloud, consumed co-location for a number of different IT companies, SaaS companies and others of the like. And when I got the opportunity to come work for a cloud hosting company called hosting.com back in January of 2014, if I'm not mistaken, I have been in this space ever since and absolutely enjoyed learning more about where cloud is going, co-location is going, edge network, all the different components to what this industry is all about. That's excellent. Now let's go back in time. Technology, was that even on the radar when you were a kid? It's interesting. My stepdad was actually a network administrator for banks back in the day when I was a kid. And so we actually had PCs in the house growing up. And so I learned technology at a very early age, doing my DOS prompting to do the different little things that I wanted to do as a young teenager. So technology was still new and early. Internet came a little later, but at least I started to get my hands around technology again, very early on in my adolescence, I shall say. So we're trying to dig in over here, right? You've got a very interesting background. You were in sales, then you got involved in programming, then you got involved in sales, then you were a recruiter. And then you were in SAS. And then you got a degree in fine arts, if I don't. But, yeah, uh, arts, arts. arts and business. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's like touching so many different segments and elements in what we do. Could you expand a little bit of this? Let's like, peel, let's peel the journey piece range. On it's definitely an interesting journey that I wouldn't say that I wouldn't suggest it to someone, but it's not the traditional journey of how you wind up getting to this place in your career. But I will say I enjoyed that journey because I learned so many different parts of the business. And so now that I sit, I understand what so many of my teams do. So yes, I started off recruiting at 19 years old, clerical warehouse. They were looking for a help desk position. All of a sudden, because I had technology background, they brought me in to do some weekend work and then they offered me a job, said, hey, we'd love for you to do help desk for us. Within six months, that went from being help desk to becoming network administrator. Then they decided they wanted to send me to Seattle to work on site at Microsoft and program, which was a completely different thing for me. Programmed for Neiman Marcus for five years on their financial side of the business. This was back in the day when we were building everything in Excel and Access because you didn't have the cool new technologies you have today. So it was to kind of build what you could and integrate the technologies together. And interestingly enough, they still use one of the programs that I built for them back in 2003 for their fantasy gifts system that they use. But yeah, so then went into back into recruiting, doing the technical side with my background, understanding networking, understanding program was very successful with that helped build a recruiting department for a government consulting firm in DC, then went on to project management and then worked my way up through different management, doing SaaS and understanding what was needed from the infrastructure side. I was the infrastructure guy, but I also managed development teams at a couple of different firms. So again, it's just a very interesting path that is not your traditional way, but I got to work so many jobs and understand so many parts of the business that I feel it helps me be really successful at what I do today. How did you learn programming? How did that even happen? 
they actually said, hey, we need somebody to go do programming up in Seattle. And they said, we'll give you a test. I had never done it. And I just started working on it. Again, a lot of it came back from the facts that I had done programming code when I learned technology in the very beginning, right? With DOS prompting and all of that. So it was, it was all very similar. And so I took that test going, I have no idea how I'm going to do on this. Actually did really, really well on it. They were impressed and said, hey, come do it for us. And then it just, it was all self-taught, self-learned back then. So it was, it was an interesting journey. I just kept learning different technologies and figuring out how to pull them all together. I think it's missing, right? This idea of learning through doing, as opposed to like going through a traditional kind of formalized education process where you're learning theoretically, and then you're trying to apply those three theoretical principles. And I've always found that the people that come on that talk about the kind of on the job training or the having to do something as a reaction to something else, it's that contextualization of the subject matter that ends up really creating someone that is successful at, at what they're doing because they actually understand it. No, you it's, it's interesting. You, would you say that your stepdad actually had influenced you to get into the space? It sounds like, right? There's certainly an aptitude. Programming is not something that anybody can just pick up. There was some connecting point there with your stepfather being involved in this industry in some capacity. Yeah, absolutely. If I wouldn't have had technology in the house as a kid growing up, I don't know that I ever would have wound up here because all the aptitude tests said that I should get into government or I should be a leader or a coach or something of that nature. And so at the end of the day, still wound up in leadership, obviously, but the technology piece kind of built the groundwork for me to be able to get to that point. And absolutely, I don't think I would have done that if I didn't have technology in the house growing up as a kid and really enjoyed getting into and understanding how technology worked. Anybody else in the household? You know what? None of the other kids are in technology. Interestingly enough, I have two brothers that own their own chiropractic clinics and my sister cuts hair and I have another brother. He does, he's mostly in bands. That's what he enjoys to do, but he also reads books for Audible. So he does voiceover for sci-fi books for Audible. So we we're all across the board, all sorts of different that things. Prefer, that might be the first person I've ever heard that. I can imagine like in being introduced to someone like that. Say, I'm a voiceover guy. I read a lot of Audible books. It must be something in Texas water, you know? It's, <laughs> the other one is McConaughey. Yeah, absolutely. Right. He does. He has that voice. He's, he does Johnny Cash impersonations as well. He'll go to senior living facilities and play kind of old school music. He has that kind of voice. So you have the same DNA. Voice. You have a Johnny Cash? <laughs> I don't, I don't have quite the voice he has. I, I've been told I have a decent broadcasting voice, but broadcasting was not in my future. Although I would have loved to gone into sports broadcasting, honestly. Well, talking about sports, you've got a few things in the back. Could you tell us a little bit about what's back there? Yeah, absolutely. So Michael Jordan, 1984 Olympic Jersey, when he came out of college. So huge Michael Jordan fan, always tried to be like him playing basketball growing up and sports was a big part of my life. Coached actually select basketball for a while after high school, coached a little fast pitch softball for high school for a little bit. And the other Jersey that's back there is the fall team that I captained was a championship. It's a little bit of a different league. ESPN's actually done a, a special on the league because it's been around for over 45 years and they do a new draft every spring and every fall. And there's only 20 teams each season. And it's a really competitive league. It's a lot of fun. But yeah, those are the two pieces I have up there. And a lot of trophies. I've won a number of like either gold glove or silver slugger awards in that league as I'm quite competitive to say the least. People don't always correlate like what we do for a living, the critical infrastructure industry with sports. And one of the things we, I love is like bringing out the things that the other interests, the hobbies, the sporting things to try to humanize what we do. So it's amazing that continued to be a passion of yours. Is that something that you translate over into the professional world as well? Were you on teams that were like company teams and stuff like that, or has it not really crossed over? No, absolutely. A number of golf events, obviously getting out there and doing that type of stuff has translated in the business world and then played on company softball teams and played in basketball leagues, brought a team here in Dallas from one of the companies I was at to play in a basketball league. So always kind of brought that in. And I, I feel like it applies so much again, from the days of coaching and all of that, to me, building teams, regardless of the industry that you're in is critical to being successful. And so I take a lot of the principles of 
being competitive, but also what it takes to build true key team chemistry to be successful through everything that I do, including my career, which is a part of why I feel like I've had some of the success that I've had is, is being able to build those teams and build strong environments for people to work in and be successful. As a CEO of Colo House, that's a massive undertaking, I think, in your career. You have been chief operating officer and other senior capacities throughout your career. As a CEO of Colo House, what have you learned and what are you applying from a leadership skill perspective that is, in your opinion, going to help you take Colo House to the next level? It's really interesting because I said from a young age, I wanted to be an executive at a technology firm. Knowing that sports was my real passion and dream, but I was very realistic as well. I understood statistics and numbers really well to know that the chances of me making it weren't all that great, but that's what I wanted to do. And then as I got into this space, I really wanted to be a COO. And I said, that is the highest level that I want to go. And I will be consider my career successful if I become a COO. And then I got in the COO seat and I said, man, I still don't have the impact on the overall business that I want to have. And so. Now that I'm actually sitting in the CEO seat, the second week I was in with the company, we took the leadership team and we focused on mission, vision, and values. What is the values that we're going to build for this organization? And I think that's absolutely critical to success. And then it is, I am very transparent to the organization because I knew coming up in organizations that a lot of the information was not shared from a leadership perspective. And you always felt as an employee as though you were kept in the dark. And to me, I have an all hands with my entire organization and I try to be absolutely as transparent as possible. Obviously you can't tell employees everything, but I try to tell them everything that I can so that they feel like they are part of what is going on and what is happening in the organization. And I think it also helped for them to understand that I grew up in this space, that I understand the roles that most of them are doing, and I've worked it in some capacity. So I think really understanding all the different aspects of the business, being able to come to an approach that helps employees build a career and a foundation in a space that, as we all know, is consistently looking for people as it grows and expands at such a, a, a quick pace. So trying to build careers for everyone and, and give them a platform to be successful. And I think that's really what I focus on as a CEO and, and at Colo House. It's great. Look, it's a great story. No question. I'm going to take a kind of a, an industry-wide approach. I think as an industry, people look at critical infrastructure or data centers as a model, especially if you're from the outside. You hear all of this the growth of AI, the growth of all these hyperscalers, and everyone just, they have these fancy words that Jamie and Alyssa come up with that we're all forced to use ad nauseum. And to the outside world, there's not really a clear distinction of like the different buckets of what a data center uh, operation is. I think you are the perfect person to help us solve or articulate this riddle. You have, you have the hyperscalers and the wholesalers that are selling space and power at these huge groupings of multi-megawatt deals, et cetera. And then you have what's called retail colo and retail data center space, where you're selling individual portions of a data center to multiple companies that are all over the map in terms of what they do, in terms of verticals they support. And then you have managed services that you layer on top of that. And I think Colo House is in this unique space, right? Because it operates in that kind of retail space. And there's some associations with more wholesale companies within, I'm going to try not to go into too many crazy details, but how difficult do you think it is to the outside world? You're in the CEO seat, right? So you have to, you have to talk to private equity guys, investors. You always have to worry about making sure you have enough capital. And you have these guys that come in and they're like, what, you're the data center space. So how many KW of data center space are you selling in a particular market? Why do you need all these people? It's a data center. It should run itself. How difficult is it to kind of, I don't know, educate the people that are maybe outside of the nuts and bolts of the industry about the nuances between the different types of critical infrastructure? There's a long winding setup for a question that I hope pulls your string in a way that is awesomely interesting. Go ahead. Uh, Absolutely. No, it is very interesting because, you know, I really, as much as I have been in this space for such a long time, I've been so focused on cloud and connectivity that sitting in this seat today is the first time I'm really getting to spend more time in the co-location piece of the business and, and really understand some of those nuances that you're talking about between a retail co-location deal and a wholesale co-location deal. 
and where are you focused on that from that perspective? Uh, being at my previous company at databank, it was very interesting because I ran all of the managed services, security compliance and cloud, VR backups, all of these different things. And co-location was very, very separate. And they dealt with all the retail and wholesale pieces. Right. And so understanding the differences between the businesses is extremely important. And the way that I try to explain it at best for investors to somewhat simplify it is there are basically four different flavors in my mind that allow you to take advantage of what a data center provides. Because a data center at the end of the day is about providing power and cooling 100% of the time, all the time, make sure that neither of those ever fail and they keep the computers up and running, right? And, and beyond that, then connecting the internet to that facility, right? That's what it's all about. So then what are you doing once you're inside the facility, all right? You have two flavors of co-location. You have the wholesale guys that are going to buy large amounts. Like you said, megawatts in deal size. That is a massive amount of power for those that don't understand the difference between kilowatts and megawatts and how all of that works, right? So those are the ones that are going to take up a massive amount of space. And as you mentioned, a lot of that are hyperscaler providers or large enterprises, right? So those are the big deals. Those are the big money makers that are going to ship things quickly in terms of overall revenue. But then you have retail colo and retail co-location are the other people that are going to actually do something more reasonable, a rack, two racks, even maybe half a rack. It's just, I need five to 10 to 20 servers to operate in a facility. I can manage it all myself. I might have you do an occasional thing for me within that rack and do that for me, which we all call remote hands, right? The ability to help a customer that doesn't have to come in all the time. But it really is, they want to buy their gear, they want to manage it, and they want to be able to handle all of that. But they need a facility that's going to have that critical uptime for them in terms of power and cooling. And it's going to have the connectivity they need to spread wherever they want to go in terms of internet connectivity. But to me, that's the baseline of what the revenue model can look like within a data center, because you're not getting a whole lot beyond that. There are people to manage that facility, but you're basically just getting that. Now you start to talk about bare metal, which is really making a resurgence and is really starting to grow at a quick capacity right now, because with all of the challenges of getting gear, which I can tell you still happens, there is still a, a serious capacity in terms of being able to get things like networking gear. We ordered in January, a set of network routers that aren't going to come until January of next year, right? So there are those customers that can't get that gear. Bare Metal allows them to do everything they want on top of those servers. They're just buying those servers from you. And then you're putting a layer on top for them to be able to access it and do whatever they want. And a lot of that has a lot of the similar capacity and capabilities that the hyperscalers are providing in the clouds based on what those developers can do with that gear. So that's another layer then of dollars that I could put on top of a regular co-location deal, right? So that's my next step up. And then that final step up is providing a cloud on top of those types of servers where a customer can just come in and go, all right, I just want to load my application on something. I don't want to worry about the back end of all the servers, all the patching, all the monitoring. I want you to do all of that for me, but just give me a cloud. And, and most of those that want to come into a data center and not use a hyperscaler are doing that because they don't have the development teams to be able to configure all of that and do all of that. They just want to be able to run their application on top of something that's very simple for them, going to be backed up. It has disaster recovery. It has all the pieces they need. And then I can charge X amount more dollars for that as a data center provider. So I'm looking at it as these are all of the different steps of how much, how much can I make within each rack that I sell? I can take those steps up, but that really simplifies it. And a lot of customers may have multiple needs. They may have co-location, bare metal and cloud from a certain provider because each flavor handles a different application for them. Yeah, that's great. And that comes along with a lot of challenges with the human capital deficit that we are getting ready to see with the multiverse that we're getting ready for. If we look at it, it's that we haven't even broken ice yet with the application stack. We don't have the internet bubble yet. You know, we are a fractional access to the population that's going to be using the application stack that we're going to be using. What do you think is the future of the data center sector? I think it really is still multifaceted. And I think in the next five to 10 years, 
you will see more of the actual bare metal capacity where there's developers that come in and utilize it. I think you will see less of uh, overall retail co-location. There will still be a client base that needs that. And I think you'll see more cloud and hyperscale usage. And I think that's because, like you said, it is a lack of resources. And so the resources get consolidated into the providers rather than sitting within the organizations and the corporations themselves, right? And that is where, you know, you provide a return on investment for the customers at the end of the day is you're able to save them from having to hire all of those people that they're going to have a hard time finding anyway, because we're going to be consolidating a lot of those resources and the, the pools of people to be able to handle all of that for them. So I think you're going to see more and more of that cloud bare metal consolidation. You'll still see a lot of the large scale co-location because again, the larger scale enterprises and the whole, the hyperscalers will continue to utilize that. But the real key is going to be, how do you continue to expand the markets to be able to get to, and I know this is one of those terms that we all say is way overused, the edge, but it's so real in terms of how are you getting to the end users? You look at the scale of the way IoT has grown over the last five years, faster than even we anticipated five years ago. And that's only going to continue to go more as you've got internet in your fridge and your coffee maker and everything else within the house. That's unbelievable. Everything that is encompassed in internet of things. And then you talk about, as you said, machine learning and AI, um, that is selling co-location space at an unprecedented amount. Even just over the last six months, you've seen that scale up if you talk to any of the providers. So in terms of seeing that continue to happen, to, to continue to see technology takes more and more data, that means more and more capacity, both from an internet and a server capacity piece, and it's only going to continue to scale. So seeing that develop as we continue to move forward is going to be an interesting ride to say the least, especially for those of us sitting on this side, trying to keep up with that capacity. So given the nuance, and I think all of our listeners whose heads aren't spinning or whose, ha whose eyes haven't rolled into the back of your head with all the different nuances, which I think is, I imagine, routine for one of these podcasts, do you find it difficult to kind of I've always had this problem. Like somebody comes out, I've been doing this since, since 1996, since I had long flowing hair. And in my generation, everyone was a lawyer or in finance. And you could just say that and people are like, oh yeah, lawyer or finance. And to try to articulate what you do without people just thinking, oh, you're a computer guy. So you're the guy that fixes the printer, right? How hard have you found it in your career? Not just as the CEO of Cola House, because you can say you're a CEO and then everyone will just start curtsying at you, I imagine. But throughout your career, whether it was data bank or, or some of the other previous roles, how have you articulated, what do you do for a living? To yeah, someone that's a, what do we call it? A civilian? I don't know. To someone that's well, not a... my mom and her current husband, they both have worked in the food industry their entire life, right? So they are on the sales side of selling food. And so technology is not uh, something that they are affluent in, in any way, shape or form. I set up their Eero Wi-Fi mesh within their Even the house, right? CEO is the IT guy in his family. So just keep that <laughs> in mind. Absolutely. And look, that's the difference. I, it's funny because when I, start, when I started as a CEO, the, the IT tech guy was trying to get me all set up. And I said, I've already done it all. And he goes, what? Oh, yeah, I set it all up. He looked at it. He goes, that's the first time I've ever had an executive actually do that and like manage all that. And I said, well, I came up. Doing I have, it I have known previous executives at Cola House and that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> so, but so the way that I explain it to my parents is I, especially in this space, in this sector, in terms of what do I specifically do? You can tell them you're a tech guy, but how do you explain the data center, the internet connectivity, all of that? And I put it as, think about power and electricity. That was the last major piece of infrastructure that went across the world. And you never imagine the world without power again right? It is the critical infrastructure to outlining anything that is going to happen in terms of just being able to connect the world in any way, shape, or form. We are now doing that with internet. Can anybody imagine not having connectivity in some way, shape, or form? And again, there are parts of the world that still don't to this day, but in some way, shape, or form, they've got something. So we are building that next layer of infrastructure that if it goes away, we got a lot bigger problems to worry about. But that's how I try to explain them is Power was the last main piece of infrastructure that is outlined and continues to grow the economy and everything that we build upon. Internet is that next piece. And we are the ones building 
the capacity that allows companies to utilize the internet to get to the world and for users to utilize all the technology at their fingertips, that all happens because of what we do as a business. But Jeremy, it's all in the cloud. <laughs> Which is all still a server somewhere <laughs> in the data center. Love that sticker. Love that damn sticker. <laughs> all right. So we know you're in the data rush era. Anything and everything is either connected or will be connected very soon. You mentioned refrigerators to microwaves. There is this cloud being one of the things that Phil just brought forth. We are heading towards a multiverse, right? The global economy is going to rely on data if it is not already. So well, actually, it depends, depends, it depends on the outcome of the street fight between Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. It's either going to be a multiverse <laughs> or X. But, yeah, it might be an X. Anyhow, where I'm headed with this question is that I believe with the digital transformation that we are heading into and the data center business is always going to be there. Do you feel in your leadership capacity that it's going to be commoditized within the next 10 years? Whereby data centers probably are not going to be as important as the data itself and the application stack? I've started to refer to the way that technology works today versus how it worked 10 to 15 years ago. Okay? And for me, it was as someone who programmed and dealt with it all, I had the technology infrastructure is already built and I can just build whatever application I do on top of that infrastructure. And so that's the way the world works. They already decided what servers, what internet capacity, what they were going to do. And then you just kind of built applications with those models and those pieces already in place, completely switched today. Everything is about the data and the application and the way that it's going to execute that now determines everything that underlines it from there, okay? Whether that's internet connectivity, the servers, the technology that they're using at a router level, a switch level, all the security and compliance that comes around it. Data now drives all of that in the opposite direction. And that is a complete switch from 10 to 15 years ago. So you're absolutely right. Data is the key, but at some point, it's all gotta go and flow from somewhere. So whether that is an edge data center, whether that changes in terms of its dynamic of where, the data is all going to flow to somewhere. It's all got to be processed and then it's all got to be able to move back out, right? So in some shape or form, there's going to be, have to be a location where data continues to flow in and out of for applications to be successful and to continue to do what they're doing today. So I think applications and data definitely drive technology far more than they did a decade ago. But at the end of the day, there's always going to have to be a place to process and recycle that data into the proper use for applications and other technology within homes and other places. I think we're on the same page. We're speaking the same language. The data center is the core and the foundation of any business on a go forward basis. This is like where, where everything happens, right? It's the mothership. Yep. Where I was going with that question is, okay, that's a guaranteed future, but do you feel that it's going to be a commoditized industry like oil and gas as we move forward? Yeah, I don't see that happening in the next 10 years. I don't personally, that's just my take on it. And again, I probably have a different take than a lot of other people that are in the larger scale and larger providers, because I've watched these companies that are still having to use legacy technologies that are still struggling to be able to staff accordingly, to be able to build new applications. I think for the newer companies that are able to do that and to be more fleet with their development teams, absolutely. There's so many things at their hands and access there. But I think there's so many companies out there that are still going to have to utilize these technologies over the next 10 years. I think it's going to take longer than that to make that overall shift. The thing is that AI and ML is so huge and it's starting to transform the way that we work all together. But again, those are also technologies that are used with newer development, newer coding, newer capabilities. And that's why you're seeing them expand with large enterprise and hyperscalers and those pieces. There's still such a large SMB community of businesses that just aren't there yet. And they probably won't be within the next five to 10 years. So I think those laggards are going to keep it from being fully commoditized. Do I think we get there eventually? Absolutely. I just don't see it in the next five to 10 I years. I think there are elements of it that are already commoditized. Space is a commodity. Power is a commodity. And it's all about, and to a certain extent, connectivity is a commodity. Although like everything else, there's better, worse, and there are the elements of it 
that as the CEO of Coal House, as anybody that runs a business, particularly those businesses that have commodities as part of their service offering, it's incumbent upon us to articulate what those differentiators are. Make sure that people that recognize the use case and have that use case resonate with the way they need to consume that technology be there. And I don't see that element changing anytime soon. It's why real estate to a certain extent is a commodity, but there's still a huge market of people that buy in luxury buildings and not luxury buildings and where they need to be in proximity to say a train station or not a train station. There are so many nuances on all these applications that inevitably as commoditized as our business is, there are still certain distinctions that are going to always, depending on how these applications evolve, require different companies doing different things, unless we completely go the opposite of capitalism and just have one big, just data center, just buy data center. You know, with the right. PSG. <laughs> Who knows that might happen. Right. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. It, it might. Jeremy, in your current capacity, you're probably drinking from the fire hose the last 10 months. Are there any regulatory compliance concerns, issues that you're looking forward or looking into over the next couple of years? Look forward to those? I, uh, I, I can't wait, I can't wait. I can't wait for SOC 4. SOC 4 is going to be a real game changer. Yeah, no, it's interesting because I am someone who really believes in security and compliance. I almost, if I was going to divert from this field, it was actually going to be to get into security and compliance on that side, because I feel like it's critical to being successful in, in any organization to truly protect the customer's data and information. Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, we just started our chief legal officer today who was going to handle our security and compliance piece. And I was up at four o'clock because he's over in the UK this morning working on and sending an email to him and my CTO saying, guys, I want you to know this is a critical component to what we do. And I want to make sure we invest in it properly. I've almost always, when I've walked in the door at any company, invested in make sure that we had a full evaluation on where we stand and what's going on. So all that to say, um, I do keep up with the regulations. I have been part of companies that are FedRAMP certified from a U.S. government perspective. Look at the different ISO models. I've sat in the role of being CISO at a SaaS company before. I would just say in terms of looking forward to regulations, I don't know that there's anything that I, I look forward to, as Philip said, I, mean, I think that's appropriate. But by the same token, when I think about the ones that, that concern me a little bit, it's little ones in different geographies across the world that start to concern me. We have a bare metal business that allows our customers to use older generation servers. Well, there are certain countries that are talking now about putting in legislation that will say that it, your servers can't be older than three years because we're worried about the environmental impact that that makes. And so we're going to make it a regulation that you can't use servers that are over three years old. That's a concerning regulation to me. I understand conceptually where they're trying to go with that, but these servers really are built for three to five year life. And if you're going to cut it off there, that has a material impact on our industry and what we do. Also and begs the question of, do they really think it's better for the environment to, for those things to sit in the lamp? Is that really the best place for it? I <laughs> would agree with you 100%, right? <laughs> so I think those are more of the ones that I think about data privacy between countries and how all of that works and that back and forth, I think is another thing that I try to keep a close eye on because it is extremely important because we do have multiple locations in different places where customer data we have for companies in the U S and we have for companies in the Netherlands, right? So have to make sure that we're keeping an eye on, on both sides of that. And if there is sharing of data, how do we do that? And how do we manage that to make sure we're staying compliant on both sides? And look, it's a part of ESG that is a part of what clients and customers are expecting from us is that we're thinking about the environmental impacts, the social impacts beyond just compliance and security itself. So yes, absolutely. I think those are the things that I think about a little bit more as we are evolving and changing in terms of the expectations of the regulations that we have to work under. Your experience is unique. You see a lot of people that come in as, as CEOs that have private equity background, they might have a big finance background. And I think one of the things that's missing from this kind of generation of employees is a recognition that everything they're doing, no matter what career they're at, is a skill set that they're acquiring that is a superpower in a role, in, in a different role. How much of your exposure to um, those various roles across the spectrum, across disciplinary, whatever you want to call it, do you think has contributed to your success? 
And is there some characteristic of yours that you could point to, whether it's openness or just willingness to follow different paths that you think were also contributing to allow you to kind of take what you've done and turn it into making you a CEO that actually understands the various elements of the technology that they run, which is remarkably unique. Well, appreciate that, Philip. And honestly, there's two things that I can point out immediately that come down to how I've been able to be successful at what I do and how I made this stretch of a journey that just doesn't make sense and you don't hear very often, right? And one was, I was always willing to jump out and take an opportunity that was beyond my skis, right? I was taking on jobs that I definitely did not have the qualifications for, but if someone was willing to put me in front of it, I was going to, as we talked about earlier in learning programming, I was going to learn whatever I had to be to be successful in that role. And the competitive spirit and the competitive in nature in me existed to go after it and make it happen no matter what that was. And then once I got that opportunity, it was amazing how many other opportunities presented themselves within that field and within that company because of what I was able to do there. But I think the other piece of it, and you're talking across technologies, is so much focus today has been, I'm either a networking guy or I'm a programming guy. Never shall the twain meet, right? Those are two different languages, two different fields. You never go down both. Well, I did both. And mostly because my stepdad was a network administrator. And then I got into programming because I just got the opportunity. But then what happened is when I really got into things like recruiting, I understood all the details of what was going on with any job within IT. And I knew all the nuances. So when I called somebody and I told them it was a front-end Java developer, they knew I knew what I was talking about because I actually knew their resume and I knew what they were looking for. They weren't a back-end developer, right? And then once I got into project management, there were so many times working on large government contracts where I would have the networking team and the development team come to me and say, we can't do this, don't know how to make it happen. And I would go, okay, let's get in the room. And I would sit down and I'd go, networking team, give me all your requirements because I understood them. Okay, development team, give me all your requirements because I understood them. And then I would think about a solution. I would start to put it up on the board and I'd go, all right, I'm gonna propose this solution networking team. Does that actually work for you? It looks like it meets all your requirements. Yes, absolutely. It does. Development team. This looks like it meets all your requirements. Can you do that? Yes, we can. And so I was able to sit in the middle and solve a lot of those complicated problems that neither team could sit down and talk amongst themselves. And so understanding both of those sides of the platform is a rarity. And for those people that can do it, it can create a very successful career. And I feel like that's where I'm very fortunate that I had the opportunity to do both. And it really did give me an opportunity for advancement multiple times. Absolutely. That's, I think, the core of the message. You got to be diverse in your abilities and want to be able to learn and look at other sectors or verticals within our business units. Absolutely. Right? Jeremy, this has been absolutely phenomenal. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Before we jet, what would you tell the younger generation? What would be your message? No pressure, Jeremy, just like the future, <laughs> for the future of civilization to solve that problem for us. Yes. Well, with multiple kids and multiple grandkids, I'm thinking about that on a consistent basis, right? How do I help groom them and get them ready for the world ahead? And it really is, regardless of what you want to do or how you want to go about doing that, is having a passion for learning and understanding and really trying to get hands on and learn it yourself. As we talked about, there is the piece of, okay, I just want to theoretically understand that and have that, but getting some hands-on in each of those pieces, whatever it is, and learning multiple things, learning multiple aspects of how things work throughout our society, whether that's finance, whether that's technology, whatever those pieces are, technology is going to be a piece of their lives no matter what. And they understand technology in a better way than we did at their age. So it is learning the different aspects and components and it, it just don't let it all be theoretical. Really try to take some time to be hands-on because it will pay off in the long run when you can understand multiple aspects of what makes the world go forward. Well, thank you very much for the advice. Thank you for joining us today at the Nomad Futures Podcast. I look forward to meeting in person in a couple of weeks when I'm out in Dallas. Thank you again. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. So Appreciate much. the opportunity. And, and, and honestly, it's not fair that that's what you look like as a grandfather. It's just a, <laughs> what, 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 hope, what hope do the rest of us have? My God. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for everything. 
This has been great. Nothing lasts forever. Markets will come back, currencies will rebound, businesses will go on, and we will all move on. That could happen next week, next month, or next year. At Nomad Futures, we are confident that those who prepare rather than panic will come out of this stronger. Thank you for joining us. This has been brought to you by Nomad Futurist. Check us online at nomadfuturist.org. And thank you for listening and subscribing as well as your continued support.